Hi everyone, my name is Misha Johns and I am the president of the Putnam County Historical Society. I'm also the Putnam County Special Collections archivist out at the library. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about one of my favorite hobbies, which is spinning, using a spinning wheel. Uh, but first I want to tell you a little bit about spinning itself. Um, spinning is actually a very interesting technology. It dates back thousands of years and it's one of the first universals. So uh, there are some technologies that mankind around the world pretty much clicked into. Um, you know, the wheel, fire, things like that. Most everyone figured those things out. And most cultures that had access to either wool-bearing animals like uh, sheep, goats, or um, a fibrous plant like cotton or, or flax to make linen, they figured out how to spin these fibers into a kind of uh, th thread to make uh, cloth out of on a loom by weaving. Um, so of course people didn't start out with a spinning wheel. Um, and one of the oldest technologies right up there with you know stone tools and fishing weights were drop spindles. Um, this is a drop spindle and we find them all over the world. Um, this is a pretty typical, what we call a top whirl spindle. That's because the whirl, the circle part, the disc, is at the top. Um, and so to use one of these, um, all you have to do, it's pretty low tech. There's a little notch in the side of it and I slide my thread into it, wind it once or twice around the hook for good measure. Then I just draw my thread out and I give it a flick with my finger and I allow the twist to travel up the yarn and into the wool that I'm holding. All drop spindles work this way even when they're different. There are top, middle, and bottom whorl spindles and different cultures around the world use different ones. As you can see, mine is all wood. It has a little brass hook on it. Um, back in the Roman times, they would have had a wooden shaft and the whorl, usually in the middle, would have been made out of lead and often pressed into very pretty shapes and floral designs. Um, when you go up north to places like Norway and Finland, um, they often used, um, there's not a lot of trees when you get into the Arctic areas and it's really cold. They actually would have used animal bone for the uh, shaft and their whorl would have been a carved reindeer antler. So wherever they were, they managed to find whatever materials worked. Um, some Native Americans who made rudimentary stuff in the Southeast uh, used seashells. Um, Native Americans in the Southwest, uh, especially um, the, the Puebla, they really mastered this. They have beautiful whorls, um, beautiful spindles that they use. Essentially, um, all you're doing is putting twist to the fiber. And the reason that works is because these fibers have scales on them. If you ever watched one of those documentaries like CSI and they're, you know, they're like matching the scales on the hair, you know, oh, it's a match. That's kind of what you're doing with this. Um, these animal fibers, this one is camel. Um, they have little tiny scales on them. And when you have the fiber loose, it just pulls right apart. It has no strength to it. But because it has scales on it, as soon as you twist those fibers together a little bit, they lock in place and they don't pull apart. And so all you're doing is introducing twist to this fiber. Uh, the different kinds of fiber are classified by their lengths. So that's your staple length. Most are like three to four. Most of your wool, if you have like a, um, if you have like a merino sweater or something from a merino sheep, that's about three inches. There are long, longer staples. Um, some alpacas and some sheep like teaswater can get up to 12 inches long, the hair can. And then when you get into things like camel, you're about two inches. Um, Angora rabbits about one. They're very difficult to spin. These shorter fibers, you have to twist them a lot faster and put a lot more spins into it for them to hold together. The longer ones, you don't need as much twist in it to hold it together. So the weight of your spindle will be kind of defined by what kind of fiber you're making. That's why um, the Romans could have used lead and stuff because they were using um, linen. They were doing flax and it's a big, long plant fiber. Um, a lot of people talk about spinning silk. 
silk was never spun. A really, really good silk, they actually unravel it by the single strand of thread and use that. Um, so people don't usually spin silk unless it's low quality silk. That's another story though. What happened is some cultures realized that basically the easy thing to do is to take this, turn it on its side and drive it with a chain. Essentially, this is like a bicycle. You, in your bicycle, your put, foot pushes a pedal that has a small gear with a chain on it that turns a bigger wheel. Well, we're doing the opposite. My foot presses a pedal that turns a big wheel, which turns a smaller wheel. And what this does is it makes the smaller wheel turn super fast. My wheel is an 18 to one ratio, which means every time my wheel makes one rotation, this little spin, this bobbin down here does 18. And sometimes they go up to 24, which is really fast. They use that for thread, like when you make lace. Now, mine is foot driven. One of the earliest spinning wheels actually came from China and it was water driven. It actually had almost like a water wheel on it and the water would turn the wheel to spin the thread. There are a lot of different designs for wheels. They changed over time. Um, this kind called the Saxony wheel was pretty much the wheel of choice for Europe. Um, from about 1600 onwards, and even today they still use it. Now, by the time we reach the Civil War era, we're getting into kind of industrialization. For many hundreds, even thousands of years, spinning, whether on a spindle or on a wheel, was kind of a cottage industry. It was something that women always, always did. You can even look back at medieval paintings and find paintings of women with drop spindles. There's some really great ones where the woman is like riding on the back of a horse, feeding the dog with one hand, holding the baby in the other and doing a drop spindle with one hand while she's doing supper. And it's kind of satire, but it's true. Uh, drop spindling was something you did pretty constantly because it got you a little extra money on the side. Um, everybody had to have clothes. You can weave the clothes faster than you can spin them. So everybody would spin it, sell it to the weaver, and the weaver would make the clothes out of them. Now, as I said, by the time we reached um, Civil War era, we'd pretty much run out of need for this. Uh, we were moving towards industrialization. Um, they were kind of moving the wheels out of the home and it kind of became such that the South had agriculture and they produced the cotton while the North had the machines, the factories and the people to spin it into yarn. So not everybody had spinning wheels in their home and were using them. However, when the war broke out, there was an issue. The South had tons of cotton and no machines to put it on. And the North had all the machines, but they had no cotton to use. If you lived during this time period, there was one thing you couldn't live without, and that was string. String was required for everything. If you wanted to send a package to someone, you had to tie it with string. If you wanted to sew a button on or fix your clothes, you needed thread or string. If you got cut and your doctor had to give you stitches, which you probably wouldn't have survived, but if you needed those stitches, you had to have string. String became a commodity. You couldn't just run down to the store and buy it. You didn't have duct tape, so you had to make your own. During the Civil War era, this saw women actually going and pulling their grandmother's spinning wheels out of the attic that hadn't been used in 10 or 20 years, bringing them down and learning how to use them. It became commonplace for women, especially up north, to keep a few cotton plants on their windowsill just so they could pick one off. One little cotton plant, and I've got a little branch of it here. It grows like this. It's like a flower. Uh, when the flower dies, it dries up and it pops open and it busts out this centerpiece, this, this cottony stuff. Um, cotton is pretty miserable. The plant is very sharp and prickly. Um, so your fingers often get pricked and bleed while you're picking it. Um, and then inside of it, it's full of seeds. So you have to gin the cotton to get the seeds out of it. Um, it's a pretty miserable process for a very uh, beloved plant that everybody wanted their clothes made out of. So 
women would start keeping uh, a few plants of this in their homes so that they could quickly spin up some thread when they needed it. One of these bowls, B-O-L-L-E-S, these balls of yarn, uh, ball, <laughs> these balls of, of cotton, could probably produce, um, if you're doing like a, a sewing thread type, would produce a, a good, you know, maybe 15, 20 feet of it. Uh, certainly enough for you to, to stitch up some clothes or put a button back on. Uh, so it became very common to have a plant and to know how to use a spinning wheel or at the very least a drop spindle so that you could produce some thread for your home. Uh, the spinning wheel itself is a pretty cool device because it combines two items that you definitely know and definitely have, well, probably have used them. One is, as I said earlier, the bicycle. Um, you have these things. This is, you know, the bicycle obviously came long after the spinning wheel. The other thing is this bobbin. Um, the bobbin and flyer, this outer part is called the flyer and the inner part is the bobbin. It spins at a different speed, which I control with this peg down here. And as I spin it, it's actually pulling the, the yarn out of my hand and winding it onto the bobbin, exactly how a reel would for a rod and reel fishing uh, tool. So from the spinning wheel, you get these devices. There's a lot of other things that come from spinning that you probably didn't know about. Um, one of the things women used to do all the time is, you know, while they're spinning wool, they would tell stories and gossip. And that's where you get the phrase spinning a yarn. Are you spinning a yarn? Are you, are you blowing something out of proportion and telling a little fibby story or some gossip? Um, other phrases like dyed in the wool also comes from spinning. Um, if you had the money, you would actually purchase a fleece of wool from the animal and have it dyed before it was spun. The color is more lustrous and more even, but it also means that you have paid the money to have that, that wool dedicated to whatever garment's being made for you. So dyed in the wool uh, means that from, from its inception, it was meant to be this, which when you think of a person, it basically means they were raised that way and they're going to be that person. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little bit of spinning so you can see what it looks like. Um, what happens is there is a treadle down at the bottom and I push it with my foot, which pushes this condyle rod. Um, this is almost like the pedal on your bicycle, the, the little the rod that turns the wheel. It's going to turn this wheel, which will be pulled by this, which is not the yarn I'm spinning. This is actually like the chain on a bicycle. Um, it will pull this which will spin it. And the, the, as I said, the flyer and the bobbin will pull at two different speeds. And as I spin, it will actually bring the twist up here into this and form it into yarn in my hands. So as you can see, I'm actually, it's pulling it right out of my hands. Um, and if I turn this thing tighter, it would slow down my bobbin and make it pull it even faster out of my hands. I have to be careful to make sure that the amount of twist I put in is even so that my thread stays nice and smooth as I pull it. It goes through um, the orifice here and it goes up onto this series of hooks and then it spins onto the bobbin you see down below. So that is how a spinning wheel works and I hope you've had a lot of fun learning about it and its place in uh, the Civil War home. Once again, my name is Misha Johns, and I thank you for joining me today. Have a great day.